Namaste. So after several requests, I have decided to continue with Lalita Sahasranamam. Uh, I guess our decision to take the Sri Vidya and make it the centerpiece of our channel has attracted quite uh, a few of the Sri Vidya community from all around the world. And so uh, we're going to continue in that line. And I think continuing the Sahasranama is a big piece of that. So from time to time, we're going to go on with Lalita Sahasranama. Now we're in a very interesting section of the thousand names. We're almost at 100 names. And this section is about the Kundalini. It introduces the terminology of Kundalini and the structure of Kundalini, which we have been over many, many times on this channel. If you look back in past videos, you'll see we talk about the six chakras and the path, huh? the Ida, the Pingala, and the Sushumna, the three nadis in the spine. And we talk about how the aim of Shakti is to unite with Shiva in Sushumna. So now we're going to pick up with Nama number 96, Akula. Akula has several different senses, seven different senses actually, that are used in the Sri Lalita Sahasranama. And in the beginning, it is to signify that she has no family, no kula. Kula can mean family. That's a very common meaning. And because she is created directly by Shiva, she has no mother and father. She has no family. Her family are the innumerable shaktis that she emanates to bring order to the universe and to uh, protect all the planetary systems and the demigods and the devotees. That is her main foremost responsibility. So whenever she sees anything threatening them, then she becomes irate and she appears and defends them and attacking the demons gives back the universe to the demigods or gives prosperity to the devotees like that. And in this way, she accomplishes her prime objective to protect the Vedic culture and to give the response, the appropriate response to those who follow the path. So, of course, there's lots more. <laughs> now, Akula also means beyond the path of the six chakras. There are six chakras beginning with Muladhara at the base of the spine. And at the top, there's the Shushumna, but the Shushumna isn't really a chakra because it's unlimited. It's called the thousand petal lotus, but actually it's unlimited petals. <laughs> and this is where Shiva resides. So in other words, the, the game or the, the purpose or the process is for Shakti to be able to rise gradually through the six chakras and then meet and unite with Shiva in Shashumna. And this is Samadhi, this is Moksha, this is liberation, this is bliss, this is, you know, everything that we strive for on the spiritual path. As when uh, Shiva and Shakti unite, this is the most wonderful thing. And so the whole purpose of Tantra it's not actually sexual, although there are some sexual practices in some branches of Tantra. They still have the same purpose of bringing Shakti and Shiva together. So this is far beyond the kind of Tantra that's usually taught in the West, which is actually a very perverted, uh, distorted, and limited version of the authentic Tantra given in the Mahanirvana Tantra and other similar scriptures. 
So what else? It is said that the Kula path has lotuses at both ends. There is one lotus in the Muladhara chakra and another at the top in Shahasrara. The Muladhara only has two petals. But because she is duality, the essence of duality, but the thousand petal lotus at the top is actually infinite petals, and that's Shiva. Shiva is unlimited, inconceivable, without any boundaries. So, in these late namas, 90 through 96, the word kula has been used in seven different contexts. So, it starts by saying that she likes the taste of ambrosia. Ambrosia is the energy that uh, drops down from the top of the head when Shiva and Shakti are in union. And finally, Akula at the end finishes by saying, actually, she's beyond the Kula. She's beyond the path. She's actually non-different from Shiva. So he is the Nirguna Brahman and she is the Saguna Brahman, both Brahman both non-dual, both unlimitedly powerful, just different aspects like yin and yang of the same energy. So let's go on. Number 97 is Samayantasta. Samayantasta means she is the center or the aim or the goal of the samana, practices. Uh, you have, on one side, you have the Kula path, which is kind of very natural, huh? very kind of uh, funky <laughs> and, and simple, actually. And on the other side, you have the Samana path, which is highly elaborate, highly intellectual, and highly uh, religious also with many, many rituals, many, many mantras and different practices that I actually, nobody can learn them all in one lifetime. <laughs> it's so elaborate. So what's the difference? Well, we've talked in the past about the feminine path and the masculine path. The feminine path is more intuitive, more natural, more about listening to the body, listening to the senses, and following the course of nature. While the masculine path is also known as the yoga path, which is a path of will, it's a path of knowledge, and it's a path of doing things, huh? rather than surrendering as in the feminine path. The yoga path is about doing many, many, many things. <laughs> It's very busy. They both wind up at the same place, but coming from someone who has tried and had experience on both paths, I have to say that in the end, one swings over to the feminine path, the Sahajya path, and surrenders. And that's really the top. Uh, one gets to the point where one has tried everything, and it still hasn't given permanent relief from suffering. So one says, well, I've tried everything else. Let me try this surrender. And that's the point at which the ego finally drops. So let me read some of the commentary here. The internal worship is more powerful than the external worship. This is another feature of the uh, Kula path, or the natural path, Sahaja path. Sahaja means natural or organic. Huh? And this can be external, but really it's much better if it's internal. And this goes for both actually, because external rituals only give external results. But the internal process, the internal puja, 
The internal worship gives internal results. And these are what we're actually after, isn't it? I mean, yes, it's nice to have external blessings like prosperity, good health, a good community or uh, social context and so on. But what we're really after is enlightenment. We're really after the liberation. Huh? We really want to be free from the compulsion of material karma. And this is something that only she can give. Even, you know, there are stories, there's one story <laughs> where Shiva and Shakti are traveling through space on Nandi, and they come across a yogi. Uh, he's sitting there just in the middle of space, meditating. And so Shakti says to Shiva, give him liberation. And Shiva says, oh, okay, <laughs> and gives it. <laughs> That's only because he was actually a devotee of Shiva. And so to preserve his relationship with Shiva, she had Shiva do it. But you know, it's said right in the first verse of the greatest poem by Shankaracharya uh, that without her, Shiva can't do anything. In fact, she is the one who gives Shiva and Vishnu their forms. So she is the power, she is the Shakti, and she is the one who makes the gods potent. So the thing is, these both paths are actually equal. And there's a long explanation in the commentary, which you should definitely download and read, about how Shiva and Shakti are actually equal. For example, in their names. For every name of Shiva, there's an equal name of Shakti, huh? like Gaura and Gauri for example. So, and there are hundreds and thousands of names like that. And in this Sahasranamam, uh, there are many names that are exactly identical to Shiva's name, but just in the feminine uh, gender. So in that way, they're equal. And they're also equal in terms of worship, that Shiva is never worshiped without Shakti, and Shakti is never worshiped without Shiva. Yes, one may be more in the foreground and the other one in the background, but still, they are together. They are a pair, huh? and they're never worshipped alone, always together or in relationship. And that's the thing, because they represent the fundamental duality in the universe, male and female, black and white, light and dark. Huh? So, of course, they need each other. They define each other. Without one, the other one cannot really exist. So in this way, they're co-equal and they're always worshipped on the same platform. Kula means race, community, country, etc. And those who worship Shakti are called Kaula. And the Shaktas, the Kaulas follow the Tantras, whereas the Vaishnavas follow the uh, more the Puranas. And what is the difference? Well, the Tantras are broader. They accept not only the mode of goodness, the Sattva Guna, but also the mode of passion, Raja Guna, and even the mode of ignorance, Tamo Guna. For example, in certain Tantras, one is to offer meat. So that is, of course, completely prohibited in the uh, Puranic type scriptures and even some of the uh, Sattvic Tantras, the Vaishnava Tantras. So that's the difference. The Brahmana community tries to say that only worship in the mode of goodness is acceptable. But actually we see that even great demons get boons from Shiva by doing penances that are in the mode of passion or ignorance. So actually Shiva is wide open to everybody. He doesn't discriminate anybody. 
He accepts everyone. And as long as they're worshiping him, as long as they're worshiping Shakti, then he protects them. Of course, if they later on do something offensive, he's ready to punish them also. That's why Shiva is called Ashutosh. Ashutosh means easily pleased, but he's also easily offended. So be careful. Aung Tatsat. Aung Shakti Aung.